So um, let's move on to uh, rheumatoid arthritis is a complex disease. Uh, all diseases are complex, but maybe rheumatoid is more complex than others. Uh, and uh, talk about stratification rheumatoid arthritis and uh, LEADS uh, MRC program here, which is uh, the Matura Consortium uh, looking at treatment uh, stratification. So um, just to define what I mean by stratified, I, I now realise after this morning's talk that this is not the, the best word to use, but nonetheless it is the one that I have been using. And when I'm talking about stratified medicine, I'm talking about stratifying groups of patients according to their response to treatment. So there are other ways of stratifying rheumatoid arthritis, for example, by disease subtypes or looking at subphenotyping. But when I'm talking about stratified medicine, I'm talking about stratifying them by their response to treatment. So rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease affecting about one in a hundred people. Um, it's characterised by joint inflammation and it's the joints that are lined by a synovial membrane. So characteristically it starts in the small joints of the hands and feet with a lot of morning stiffness and swelling. And if that is left uncontrolled, then people accumulate joint damage. So the, the bone and the cartilage is worn away and eventually that leads to disability. Now, it's not just confined to joints, it's a systemic disease and it is associated with early mortality. So it's got a, a mortality rate which is equivalent to cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. So I, I am, am mainly research focused, but I still do clinics. And, and when I'm seeing new patients in clinic, I'm examining their joints and I'm thinking about, are they going to develop severe disease? And the patient's probably thinking about, are they going to end up in a wheelchair, which is a, a kind of a common um, outcome in years gone by for patients with rheumatoid arthritis. But now we know that early effective therapy can prevent that damage and disability. And this has been a, a revolution in my uh, lifetime as a prescribing rheumatologist. And this is some data from um, a primary care inception-based cohort. So these are patients who are recruited from primary care as soon as they have swelling of two or more joints that's lasting for four or more weeks. So really, really early disease. And what this is showing you is that <clears throat> this is um, a measure of HACK, which is the Health Assessment Questionnaire, and that is a marker of disability in rheumatoid arthritis. And this graph is showing you the HACK at 10 years. So this is 10 years after these patients first present with this very early inflammatory arthritis in the joints. Now, if they respond to treatment within the first six months of them being treated, their HAC score is, shows a 30% improvement over when they first presented. So this is 10 years later. With age, there's always a decline in um, functional ability. So this is remarkable, that if you respond to treatment within the first six months, by 10 years, you can see this dramatic improvement. Compared with those who do not respond within the first six months, that may be because the drug wasn't effective or they had side effects, it really doesn't matter. If you are not on effective therapy within the first six months, your disability score at 10 years is far worse than if you responded immediately. So how do we treat rheumatoid arthritis? Well, we, we have a class of synthetic drugs, which we call DMARDs, or disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And of those, methotrexate is the most commonly used, and it's the kind of the gold standard by which other drugs are compared. And methotrexate works reasonably well, it's also very cheap. So to treat a patient for a year uh, costs about 75 pounds. Um, in 2001 or so, the first 
biologics started to be licensed for use in the UK. And biologic drugs are um, <coughs> drugs that have been uh, formulated based on a naturally occurring protein and they cannot be given orally because they would be digested by the acid in the stomach. They have to be given by injection because they're proteins and they have to be um, uh, produced uh, by organic organisms like yeast. And so they are expensive. And the first class of biologic to be produced was something called anti-TNF drugs. So these are drugs that um, essentially block the tumor necrosis factor pathway. And now you can see that there's a, a number of these drugs available for use. Um, next came rituximab, which is a, a B cell depleting drug. And then more recently, we've had IL-6 inhibitors, uh, tocilizumab. And what's not on this slide, which should be, is a, a CTLA-4 analogue called a batacept. So, <clears throat> these drugs have really transformed the lives of some patients with rheumatoid arthritis and many patients show improvement but only about one in five show complete remission and one in five don't respond at all. So depending on how you define response um, there's an inadequate response in about 40% of patients. <coughs> now these biologic drugs cost £10,000 per patient per year. So that has huge financial implications. They're also associated but with rare but serious side effects. And up until a few years ago, the way we could prescribe drugs for rheumatoid arthritis was very regulated by the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence. And so everyone had to be started on methotrexate. And only when patients' disease failed to respond to methotrexate plus at least one other DMARD could they be considered <coughs> for a biologic therapy. And the first biologic had to be anti-TNF. And there was no logic to that, it's just that there was more known about anti-TNF. So they're being recommended in the order they came to market rather than on any rational prescribing decision. <coughs> so had to use anti-TNF first line, and if they failed anti-TNF, then you could go on to rituximab and so on. You, could, uh, you would then serially try, cycle through all the biologics that were available. So you can imagine that uh, all this takes time. It takes at least six months to, uh, be, uh, to, for a patient to fail methotrexate. It's usually a lot longer than that. So during this time, uh, there's ongoing inflammation, so quality of life for the patient is poor. They're exposed to toxicity, which they shouldn't need to be exposed to if the drug's never going to work, and they're accumulating disability. So there's a fantastic health economic and medical reason for trying to target these drugs better. And this is the area that I focused on. It's trying to predict who's going to respond or not to anti-TNFs. And the hypothesis is that this is not going to be a single predictor, that treatment response is a complex phenotype. And there's going to be genetic, uh, transcriptomic, epigenetic, psychological and clinical factors that all contribute to whether a patient responds or not. So thinking about clinical factors, we already know that um, <coughs> the use of methotrexate or another DMARD alongside an anti-TNF drug increases your chance of responding to that drug. We know that if you're more disabled at baseline, you're less likely to respond. So a higher HAC score means you're less likely to respond. Being female makes you less likely to respond. And carrying antibodies um, in your bloodstream makes you less likely to respond. And that's probably because it's uh, a marker of severity. <coughs> <coughs> 
But all of this only accounts for 17% of the variance in treatment response to anti-TNFs. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we could probably only predict 1% of responders and less than 1% of non-responders if we just used clinical factors alone. So it's useless for us as prescribing physicians. That's on its own. Of course, it will be useful in an algorithm. So this is illustrated here. I, I've, I, this is some statistical modelling, and if we have uh, responders in red, non-responders in blue, this is the type of uh, distribution of the response that we get. And you can draw these lines wherever you want. But if I say, if I'm going to tell a patient that they're going to respond to a dr drug, I want to be 80% certain myself that they're going to respond. So I've drawn this right-hand line at 0.8. That's 80%. If I'm going to refuse a drug to a patient, or I'm going to not recommend it, I want to be fairly certain they're not going to respond, so I've drawn this at 5%. But obviously you can move these lines and it will give you different figures. But these are my lines, um, and there's a piece of work to be done with patients about where they would like, you know, where they would like to see those lines drawn. But at the moment, it's 1% of responders and less than 1% of non-responders that we could predict. So what about genetic factors? Well, um, the history of genetic studies follows that of um, the, the studies in susceptibility. Um, started off with small candidate gene studies, generally small sample sizes, very underpowered. Response was assessed at varying time points. Um, the first genome-wide association study was done in less than 100 patients, and there's been no consistent replication of findings. O on this background, in 2004, we uh, started the Biologics in Rheumatoid Arthritis Genetics and Genomics Study Syndicate, or BRAGS, and uh, this was a, a large nationwide multi-centre collaboration. So we recruit patients from 50 centres across the UK. And um, it's anyone who's about to start, um, initially it was just anti-TNFs, we've extended it to all biologics now. And we, initially we just collected DNA. Now, of course, we collect RNA and serum and we, we collect at multiple time points and we collect psychological data and adherence data. But we have most data on DNA, where we have about 3,000. And so, um, in terms of genome-wide association studies, there have been um, a number performed. The first was from my own group, and we, we thought we'd identified five loci, but unfortunately, none have been replicated. Um, subsequently, there was a study in the Danish population that showed suggestive association at uh, this locus, which we'll come back to. Then um, in a Dutch population, a much uh, a larger sample size, there were eight loci identified, but none have yet been replicated. And the largest of all was led by Robert Plenge, um, and that was a, a GWAS of 2,700 anti-TNF treated patients. And they found association to CD84 in Atanasept-treated patients, which was a subgroup of about 800 of that total, and it almost reached genome-wide significance levels. In terms of candidate gene studies, um, various groups have looked at RA susceptibility genes, and the PTPRC gene is probably the one with the most evidence supporting association with treatment response. Um, it was first reported in a US group, and then my own group replicated it. Other groups had, haven't, but again, this, this changing pattern in small sample sizes is something that we see in RA susceptibility studies, and it's only when you put everything together that you um, have the power to detect association. And then this gene that was first found in a, in a Danish study um, a Spanish group have looked at it in an additional 500 samples and uh, show association too. But I think it's fair to say overall that genetic studies have been disappointing and there's been no, that there's no gene 
or genetic mark that we found that says, yes, you will respond or no, you won't. Um, so why is that? Well, there are lots of possible reasons which I'd like to go through with you. First of all is adherence. Um, if the patient's not taking the drug, a genetic test is not going to predict whether they'll respond or not. Secondly, I want to discuss the way we measure response at the moment, which is the DAS28 score. Thirdly, I want to consider the idea that treatment response isn't genetic. And finally, I want to discuss more about the issues of power. So, thinking about adherence. So this is data from the Bragg study where we ask a very simple question at three and six months and then we look at response at 12 months. And the question is, when you were last due to take your biologic injection, did you take it on the day agreed with the nurse or any one of these options? And we define adherent is the World Health Organization definition is only the day agreed by the healthcare provider. Everything else is non-adherent. And you might think that that's quite strict. We wanted to, to do this because we felt that if patients were going to fib to us, then we'd give them an option where they didn't have to fib too much. You know, if somebody's, <laughs> you know, missing it every now and then, they could still tick a day before or after. And that wouldn't sound so bad. So we made it, you know, this is the way we, we set out to do it. So, and as you can see, um, ever non-adherent status was significantly associated with subsequent response, as you might expect. But it does illustrate that, um, you know, we should be doing genetic studies to predict response only in patients who are taking the treatment. So what about how we measure response? So the way we measure response is some, in rheumatoid arthritis is something called the DAS28 score, disease activity score in 28 joints. And we measure, we, we press on the joints and you know, we, we um, squeeze them and uh, we do a blood test and then we ask the patient how they feel their arthritis has been over the past week. So, it, all of this information gets then put into this complicated algorithm. So, um, TJC means twen uh, tender joint count, and SJC is swollen joint count. And you can see that the, the tender joint count gets double the weighting, so 0 0.56 versus 0 0.28. That's double the weighting versus the swollen joint count in this algorithm. The patient global score, if, so a patient marks on a 10 centimetre scale how they feel their arthritis is. And so if they put 100, which is the worst it can be, that could give you 1.4 units of your DAS score, which is a third of the way you need to be to getting on a biologic. I should have said there is a threshold above which your disease has to be active before you can get onto a biologic drug. So we, this is a validated measure and it's absolutely fantastic for comparing two drugs. But what we're trying to do is predicting efficacy and we're looking at the change in DAS28 and we're looking at a mix, we're looking at a, a, a um, combined score, which is a mixture of subjective and objective measures. And we have shown that the tender joint count and the patient VAS are more correlated with psychological measures, such as anxiety and depression. So um, we feel that these are, this is evidence that the objective measures are more important in assessing um, response to therapy. So, what about the uh, argument that treatment response could have little or no genetic effect? How can we counter that argument? So, we can do that by looking at the genetic data itself. And, and you'll know that there are methods to look at the heritability based on genome-wide asso uh, association data. 
and that's using a program called GCTA. And we've done this in about 1,200 Bragg's patients. And so I'm going to draw your attention to this group here, which MAB stands for monoclonal antibodies, because anti-TNFs can be divided into a monoclonal antibody <coughs> group and um, a, a TNF receptor 2 analog. And we've got more patients in this group. So you can, a, a perfectly heritable trait, you would see a 1.0 in this column. So you can see that overall the change in the DAS28 is reasonably heritable. You know, that's not bad. You can find something with that. But of the, if you break down the scores, then the swollen joint count and the biological marker of response are the most heritable. And that fits in with our previous findings that tender joint count and VAS have more of a psychological component to them. And we are, we are never going to be able to predict how a patient feels their arthritis is because the heritability is so low. So what this is showing us is that treatment response is heritable. Um, we should be putting more weight on the objective rather than the subjective factors when we're assessing whether a treatment is working. And we may need to do some reweighting of the DAS score. And we're currently repeating this analysis in an international consortium. So what about lack of power then? So we, we know that there are 101 RA susceptibility genes, but to identify that 101 genes required over 50,000 samples. Um, we know that the largest RA susceptibility gene is the HLA-DRB1 gene. And those of you who, who've trained in medicine may have heard of the shared epitope, which is... Um, was always thought to be the largest single effect for rheumatoid arthritis, and it's a group of amino acids in the HLA-DRB1 gene. Anyway, recently that's been slightly superseded, but there, there are three positions at position 11, which lies outside the shared epitope, and these two positions that lie within the shared epitope. They're all in the DRB1 gene, they're all amino acids, and combined, this is the largest single effect on susceptibility to rheumatoid arthritis. So, in order to explore whether issues of power could be hindering us in identifying genes, we looked at this combination of amino acids. So what I'm showing you here is association with severity, and this is radiographic damage. And across the bottom, you can see the odds ratio for susceptibility, and across here, you can see the odds ratio for severity. And it, you can see here, well, we've got an odds ratio for susceptibility of 4.5. Let, let's go across here. Let's say it's about 3. The odds ratio for severity is about 1.5. So RA an RA susceptibility gene is also predicting RA severity, but with a lower effect size. Is that also true of treatment response? And you can see that the, the line does, uh, you know, it, it, there is a correlation there. It's a significant correlation, but you can see once again the effect sizes are, very, are even more reduced. So if we look at an odds ratio of about three, we come across and in terms of treatment response, it equates to an odds ratio of about 1.15. So the same RA susceptibility gene is associated with severity and it's associated with treatment response, but at each stage, the effect size is smaller, so you're going to need larger sample sizes, and at the moment, we're looking in smaller sample sizes. So just to summarise that part then, the response does show heritability. We may re need to reweight the DAS score to, to, to put greater emphasis on the objective measures Adherence should be accounted for where possible, and power is definitely an issue, so we need large sample sizes. So if we can't find genetics, we've started to look at genomics, um, particularly DNA methylation, and we've used a different study design looking at the 36 best and 36 worst responders and doing a genome-wide DNA methylation study. 
and this is like a Manhattan plot, and this is the uh, Bonferroni corrected line, and this is the false discovery rate. And you can see that we are getting significant findings um, at genome-wide levels of significance, but it needs replication. And it's a similar story for transcriptomic or expression factors, looking at very good and very bad responders doing microarray expression profiles, and we find you know, very, uh, highly significant associations that require replication before we um, believe them. What about drug levels? Well, there's been some interesting data coming out of the, uh, out of the Netherlands um, that have shown that if you measure the trough level, that's the, just before you're about to give the next dose of biologic, you measure the level of adalimumab in the bloodstream. And some patients actually have very high levels and probably don't need their next dose of biologic. Other patients have very low levels and it could be that they've developed anti-drug antibodies. So, it, uh, th this group did some theoretical modelling and they found that uh, if you implemented drug testing, then in the usual care group, only 10% of people would stop biologics. But if you'd, if you'd tested their blood level uh, of the drug and adjusted things accordingly, you could stop the biologic in 25% of people. And so that would improve the cost efficacy of these drugs. But it was a theoretical study and assumptions were made. And when we're talking about implementation of these things in the NHS and barriers to that, one of the biggest barriers would be having to measure random, uh, sorry, trough drug, drug levels because you'd have to bring the patients back the day before they were due their next dose. And we just can't manage that in the NHS at the moment. So, we wanted to look at random drug levels, and um, this was done in 311 patients. And you can see that looking at anti, uh, sorry, looking at drug level at three months and outcome at 12 months showed that there was a significant association with prediction of outcome. And what predicts drug levels? Well, having anti-drug antibodies predicts whether you've got low... If you've got anti-drug antibodies, you have lower drug levels. If you have a higher BMI, you have lower drug levels. And we don't take BMI into account when we're prescribing these drugs. And if you don't adhere, then you have lower drug levels. So by using drug levels, we'd be able to start treatment and then adjust dose according to response to improve efficacy. But we've still got this trial and error period where we don't know whether the drug's actually going to be effective. <coughs> and so um, the MRC and Arthritis Research UK have uh, jointly funded a stratified medicine programme called Matura, which I co-lead with my colleague, Prof. Uh, Costantino Pizzalis at uh, Queen Mary's and uh, in collaboration with nine industry partners and with centres across the UK. And COS is looking at synovial biopsy and whether that can predict treatment response. And I'm looking at these uh, blood-based biomarkers. And the idea is to integrate the genetic and epigenetic and expression predictors because at the moment, we have a choice if somebody fails to respond to methotrexate and another DMARD. We've got a choice of all these biologics that we could start, and we've got nothing to guide that treatment decision. And you've seen this type of um, diagram before. This is where we want to get to, where we, there's all these patients that are mixed up. We want to apply some sort of drug response algorithm that it, it, it include clinical, epigenetic, genetic... Um, psychological factors so that we can give the right drugs to the right patients and I'd just like to acknowledge all my um, collaborators uh, PhD students and postdocs some of whom are in the audience who've helped with this work so thank you very much thanks very much Anne um,
Time for one or two questions. <coughs> Sorry, you've spoken about the power of combining various elements of biomarker information within algorithms. Uh, and, and clearly that's a very appealing prospect to those of us who've done these studies and never found anything with any clinical utility. Uh, do you think that would really be workable as a care pathway in practice for the, for the patient here? Yes, I do, because there's, uh, there's precedent for, particularly in rheumatology, um, we use uh, the FRAX algorithm to, you know, we, we put in certain data points and that gives us a, a, a risk or a percentage likelihood of a 10-year fracture. We, we're used to inputting data into a DAS28 algorithm because we don't do those calculations ourselves. Um, so in rheumatology, certainly we're used to using algorithms and, and they're widely used. Tremendous. Any more questions? Can I ask about weight-based dosing? <laughs> yes. Now, I, I, I think um, we are very bad at dosing anyway. Yes. And, and we really don't take into account weight. And, no. and as the population gets bigger, yes. then an awful lot of patients are being underdosed. Uh, and our data backs that up because BMI was a predictor of drug levels yeah. and drug levels predict outcome. But there's a health economic um, implication with that uh, because if you're having to give double the dose, that, that has double the cost and it may be better to switch to a different preparation. Mm. But also dose um, tend to correlate with toxicity. Yes. And, and, and you may, you may yes. get better efficacy, but you may get actually more toxicity well, as well. You may do, yes, absolutely. So the balance is going to be very difficult, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. Thank you. Um, one of your predictors was high starting DAS levels. Yes. Um, I know the Mastermind Consortium looking at diabetes found an issue that you know, if they chose measures of response which were do you get below a certain level, clearly it's harder to get below a certain level if you start off high. Converse, if you use a percentage reduction, it's easier to reduce a big number than a small number. And I don't know whether that, is that a risk, so a systemic risk <coughs> in the approach you're taking that it would be thus that a high number would be hard to see a response in. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting because in research, we adjust for the starting dose of DAS. But in clinical practice, there's no adjustment. It's just where you end up and the change in DAS. And so although we know it's a good predictor, that it's not actually used clinically. But we do, we do use that when we're trying to, to identify genetic predictors, um, for example. Um, and I think it is important that you adjust for that starting dose, because as you say, it's harder to get down from a high dose. A, a slightly geeky one possibly about the epigenetic data. I just wonder how you deal with the confounding issue of causality and whether you actually have a way of you know, knowing whether the differences that you see are as a consequence of the response or indicate you know, whether you can actually go back and whether you have a pre-treatment sample, for example, that you can compare to see whether those changes already existed before. So those are pre-treatment samples. Okay. Uh, that, so we are looking at predictors of treatment response. And so that, that's a pre-treatment sample um, the outcome is response at three months. Well, that's really neat. Thanks. So we do have serial samples as well. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Anne.